Hi there everybody, welcome back to a wet and windy indie car today on the 7th uh, of October. Today I'm not even in Glasgow actually, I'm far away from my usual haunt actually because today um, I was called for jury duty. So I've just been uh, let go actually from the court and I'll have to come back tomorrow. And obviously I'm not allowed to talk about anything to do with what happens in the courthouse. But while I'm on the subject of, of courts, reminded me of something today. Um, sitting, waiting to be chosen in the uh, in the jury room was a bit boring, right? But when I looked up um, at the, the courtroom itself, I noticed the coat of arms behind where the, the judge's dais is. And I was looking at that and it suddenly dawned on me that um, unlike a lot of iconography associated with the British state, the coat of arms of the Scottish court system uh, is the unicorn on the left, lion on the right, unicorn holding a saltire, but the lion not holding a Union flag, but holding the English Cross of St George. And it dawned on me at that point, you know, that we still need to remember that we're not talking about um, Scotland leaving a, leaving the United Kingdom. It's actually just Scotland leaving England, because that's what the Union actually is. The Union is just two countries, England and Scotland only. Anyway, to bring things back to or back into focus today, um, the blurb I wrote at the start of the show indicated um, what is going on with Boris Johnson at the moment. And it's very hard to get away from Brexit and talk about anything else. But let's let's briefly have a quick sort of look at what is going on at the moment. Now, uh, the BBC this morning had the health secretary, uh, what's his name, Matt Hancock, on, and he was supposedly talking about. Um, the mental health of the country and some new scheme that the British government or the Tory government was planning to put in place. And he got really annoyed when um, when the interviewer asked him the question about Brexit. He, he got really uh, sort of angry and annoyed about this and sighed and rolled his eyes. As if, you know, that nobody was going to ask him about Brexit and they really wanted to get on with the day job. I mean, the day job can't be done until Brexit is sorted out. He knows this. Matt Hancock, um, I think, is as sick of Brexit as the rest of us. But anyway, the situation at the moment uh, is weird. Boris Johnson is, at the moment, going behind the backs of the European Union's negotiators in Brexit and is attempting to get some of the smaller countries, notably um, Latvia, one of them, to veto the idea of the EU giving the United Kingdom uh, a Brexit extension. In other words, he's actually trying to sabotage his own extension by asking another European country or countries behind the backs of everybody else in Europe to vote against it so that the European Union cannot offer the UK a Brexit extension. He is still trying to force a no-deal Brexit, and it's terribly, terribly obvious to everybody, but nobody is saying it, but he is forcing a no-deal Brexit. If he doesn't succeed in getting the European Union or one of the countries to veto the idea uh, and actually sabotage our own extension to, um, to, to Article 50 and get a little bit more time, he's trying to close that down. He's trying to run the clock down so that all of the options are removed so that there is only one option left and that is accept our um, terrible deal on Northern Ireland and um, this, this weird border arrangement that he's proposing or else we leave with nothing. Now it's been pointed out to me by a number of people who keep their eyes on what's going on in the background in Europe and in other places that there's a number of very good reasons why Boris wants a no deal Brexit and one of them and the one which many people have talked about is uh, the intention of the UK government to turn Brexited UK into the largest tax island haven in the world. In other words, the biggest money laundering and tax evasion centre on the planet. And for it to become the major industry of these islands to launder and hide other people's money, primarily, I think, from uh, the billionaires of the United States, but also Russia and other places as well. But when you add up all of the things that the United Kingdom is planning to do, a big trade deal with the US, selling off what's left of the, the UK's uh, public services to American corporations or their interests, and opening the United Kingdom up as a massive tax haven for American billionaires and, and, and other wealthy individuals to hide their money. What's interesting about this is nobody's actually tried to quantify exactly how much money 
the UK um, would stand to make from this enterprise? How much bigger would the operation become after Brexit? Remember that um, in November this year, the European Union's um, antitrust laws come into effect. Now, these are laws which prevent money laundering, prevent tax evasion, and close all the tax loopholes in every European country to prevent wealthy people from hiding their wealth from their own uh, tax man in their own countries. So when that happens, that would stymie all attempts by the British government to open themselves up as the biggest uh, tax haven on the planet, because they would lose um, a lot of business if, if they were forced to shut that down. City of London would suffer greatly. So that is one very strong reason why Boris is fighting as hard as he is to make sure that no deal Brexit is the final outcome. Remember that his major backers are hedge fund managers who are making large bets on the currency markets that there will be a no-deal Brexit, and they stand to make billions of pounds for these hedge funds. Hedge funds are basically, um, for those of you who don't know what they are, they, they are basically a way of making money no matter what else happens in the world, and they, they take advantage of disasters, of um, supposedly unforeseen but large catastrophic events taking place. It's almost like a gigantic bookmakers, uh, and they, they spread the bets over a lot of different things. So they always end up making some money somewhere. And a huge bet on Brexit, uh, a no-deal Brexit, would make billions for them. And these are the guys who have backed Boris, backed the Leave campaign, are now backing this push for a no-deal Brexit so that it happens. Everybody knows this is what's happening. Everybody can tell this is what's happening, but nobody wants to say it, especially not um, on the BBC. Now... Coming back to where we're at at the moment, having tried to sabotage the idea of getting an extension by going behind the backs of the European Union's negotiators and trying to cherry-pick individual small countries to veto it, Boris is now running out of options to force a no deal. So his next option is proroguing Parliament again, in other words, suspending Parliament again, um, so that there can be no more attempts legally to block a no-deal Brexit. Now, you'll be aware of the so-called Ben Act, what Boris calls the, the Surrender Act. This is the um, Act of Parliament, which was voted on in Westminster in the House of Commons, and is there to make sure that Boris Johnson, in the event that no deal can be done, that he is forced to formally ask the, the European Union for an extension to the Brexit deadline, so that there is time to uh, to come up with a better idea. Now, if that happens and Boris is forced into doing that, he has very few options left. But there have been hints coming from Number 10 that if he volunteers to uh, ask for this extension and if he um, is forced to ask for this extension, that these create some kind of loophole or some go-around that allows him uh, to ignore the Ben Act in some way or to... Um, to go through the motions of fulfilling the Ben Act or pretending to and then um, and then basically saying we don't want an extension after all. So there are all kinds of workarounds. Remember the British state has no written constitution, no rules that actually tell the Prime Minister what they can and can't do. There are only uh, precedents and there are um, instruments, statutory instruments. These are, are things that you can do in Parliament that allow you to make changes to legislation without necessarily having to vote on it. Boris will use those powers. He'll use the Henry VIII powers. He'll use whatever um, means he can to wriggle out of having to ask for an extension. But if he is finally forced to do it, what will happen is a general election. And the, the smart money is that Boris will do a deal with, with Farage's Brexit party. And the two of these, the, the, the right wing, the far right wing of the Tory party and the Brexit party combined might win enough MPs, enough seats to get a majority to force through the no deal. Now this is conjecture at the moment. Nobody knows whether he will manage to do this because as I said, there are no rules. Uh, we're in completely uncharted legal and uh, constitutional territory here. The weird thing about all of this is that if Boris's plan actually works and there is a no-deal Brexit, that forces the European Union, by default, to create its own hard border 
uh, across Ireland because the European Union has to have a frontier. It cannot trade um, through an open space because there would be no way to control smuggling, there would be no way to control the rules of the market beyond that boundary. So what Boris is hoping to do is to force the European Union to put up the first checkpoint so that he can blame the European Union for uh, overriding the Irish uh, agreement, the, the Good Friday Agreement. Now the trouble with all of this is that even if if the, if the European Union, just out of pure uh, spite or, or just for, for a laugh, decided to accept Boris's proposal, assume that they did, uh, in the interest of getting a deal done, that would mean that Boris would actually have to action that plan and by doing that, he would actually break one of the fundamental rules of the Act of Union, which would mean that Scotland would then be able, literally, to end the union instantly because Boris would have basically broken an international treaty which was made on behalf of Scotland and England and therefore drag Scotland into well global ill repute if you like it would sully the name of Scotland as a country and it would basically break one of the fundamental rules of the precious union which uh, is that no part of the precious union is supposed to be treated differently from any other and was definitely not supposed to break any international peace treaties ratified by the UN. So it's a mess. But in, in all of this mess, um, let's assume that we have a no deal Brexit and Britain does become a giant tax haven, a giant money laundering washing machine of an industry uh, emerges and Britain makes trillions of dollars from this in foreign currency. Wonderful, great, Boris is a success. He becomes even wealthier than he already is, and his hedge fund managers basically go off and buy countries for themselves. What happens to Scotland? Well, the interesting thing is that if we can quantify the amount of money that the United Kingdom could make from becoming the world's largest monopoly on hiding money, it might well be far more than the amount of money that England would lose in oil revenues should they agree to let Scotland become independent. And therefore, at this point, it might seem quite tempting to Boris Johnson after Brexit to simply give us the Section 30 order and let Scotland walk away from this mess. Because remember that the oil industry is in its um, autumn years. It's in its declining years. The European Union has already banned the manufacture of new diesel engine cars. And this is the beginning of the decarbonisation of Western Europe. It's just the start of it. And it means that the value of oil, petrol and diesel is going to diminish because the demand for these combustible fuels is going to eventually disappear. The demand for oil will not go completely because we do need oil for lots and lots of other things, right? for lubricants and for soap, for, um, for other kinds of fuels. Uh, for solvents, for paints, for adhesives, um, for phosphates, for chemicals, for agricultural fertilizers, all kinds of other things that come from oil, including obviously things like plastics. Uh, and we can also even convert some parts of the oil into natural gas. It's a useful commodity, but it's not going to remain uh, a stable commodity into the, into the, the near future, shall we say. So it's possible that Boris might decide um, that it's okay to let Scotland go because Britain is going to make enough trillions of dollars in foreign currency that it won't matter. The, the British economy or what's left of the English economy uh, is going to boom and everybody is going to work in an office hiding money for wealthy Americans. Fine. But that leaves Scotland still one of the, the big powerhouses of Europe with this massive energy resources, not oil, but tidal energy, wind energy, clean renewable energy and having them linked up already with Ireland, Northern Ireland, Iceland and uh, I think I'm trying to remember whether it's Norway or Sweden but there will be interconnectors running to mainland Europe. When all that's connected up Scotland becomes a giant power station. So England becomes a money black hole which makes its money by hiding other people's money Scotland makes its money by supplying the rest of the world with surplus energy. Both of these futures can happen at the same time. I'm not saying that what Boris is doing is morally or, uh, 
or legally the right thing to do. I, I don't actually believe in money laundering and tax havens. I think these things are immoral and wrong. But if that's the choice that the English government has made, then let them do it. If it allows us to leave the UK and to decide what we do with what's left of our oil and our gas, then that's fine. I don't honestly believe that, um, that Boris is even thinking that much about oil. Uh, there is a, a very strong belief in England that they're a wealthy country, that they, as they say, punch above their weight, and that there's still some kind of renowned world power of some kind. It is true that the English economy is large, um, but the English economy is based on debt and borrowing. The Scottish economy is based on trade and industry. Very, very different uh, models for a country. There have been, uh, in the past, models of how to build a new nation. Norway is quite a famous one. And believe it or not, Britain played a bit of a role in the, in the actual liberation of Norway. It was originally in a forced union with Sweden. Uh, and it was partly the British who insisted that the Swedish government let Norway go and form as a, as a, as a separate nation. Now, the fact that the British state thought to do that and thinks that long term gives you a, a rough idea of how the British establishment works. It does look at the future. I mean, it's not uh, a blindly greedy, nasty um, institution, although it has qualities like that, but it is also smart. And it also knows when the game is up. And the game is almost up now for, uh, for the Union. And they know it. And they also know that the Union may not be sustainable for much longer. And I think after 2014, they realised that Scotland was ready to move. And in a few years' time, they wouldn't be able to stop it. So I believe that Brexit uh, is the catalyst. It's the meteor that wipes out the dinosaurs in terms of what is left of the United Kingdom. Ireland was never really factored into Boris's plans originally, but he's now using Ireland as a political football to play this game against Europe. The Europeans are playing the game perfectly with a straight poker face, and they will uh, give as long an extension as Britain needs uh, at the end of this period. Remember, there's only a week to go now. There's only seven days in which Boris or his government is supposed to come up with this miracle deal. The European Union might call their bluff by accepting the deal. I don't know. And if they do that, Boris's plans could run into the buffer. But the, the whole thing is coming to a glorious head at the moment. And in the next week or so, we will see a whole series of unexpected, remarkable and weird twists and turns in the final stages of this agonisingly slow process. But at the end of it, I think that Scotland will go because I think Nicola Sturgeon, when she started planning long term, realised that this was where it was headed uh, and that no matter what else happened, all of these threads, all of these, um, these factors and forces and stresses were leading to this one cataclysmic event where Britain crashes out of Europe in some uh, unforeseen catastrophic way and becomes a massive tax island and a pseudo state of the United States at which point Scotland can't bear that any longer and wants to leave and the English will let them go because oil is no longer their future and um, oil is their past they've robbed Scotland of at least half of all its oil revenues over the last 35 years possibly more trillions of dollars have been hoovered out of Scotland's North Sea and now that England's had its fill of the oil and Britain now sees its money, its revenue stream coming from the world's wealthy billionaires hiding their money somewhere in the British Isles, they, they see a golden future. This is what Thatcher envisaged many years ago, was an entirely white collar country, not a factory anywhere to be seen. Everybody basically working for banks and financial institutions and insurance companies. Uh, and the only industries in the country that were left would be the coffee shops and the burger bars that fed the office workers. The rest of it, uh, they would minimise, and they will. They will minimise the, the National Health Service and get rid of it eventually. Everybody in England will be on private health insurance, and the whole thing will switch over to the American system. And there is absolutely no way that the people of Scotland would ever put up with that. So. You can see where this is going. It's a long-term strategy, but everything's coming to a head. 
I'll be saying more about this in the next few days. But at the moment, the pieces of this incredibly complicated uh, spaghetti of different things are coming together in the next few days. But it may well be that in order to extricate the UK from Europe, Boris will have to liberate Scotland. He will have to give us the Section 30 order. Let us vote on it. Let us get clear uh, and start with a clean slate and our own Scottish pound. Uh, and we'll be in the safe haven of Europe. As far as we're concerned, there is strength in numbers and in the way that the whole of the, the global economy has been tossed up in the air and the pieces are all now falling back down again. The countries have got to decide where they're going to finish up. The United Kingdom wants to be in America's court, in its sphere of influence. They don't want to be in Europe anymore. They want to be with Trump. Scotland wants the opposite. We're pulling in the European direction. Irish, they're staying in the European direction. The Northern Irish caught in the middle, being pulled in different ways, but primarily the people of Northern Ireland want to be in Europe. Whether they are unionist or not, they want to be in Europe. And the DUP is going to die off because they are going to be so unpopular very shortly that nobody will elect them ever again. Anyway, those are my opinions and my an analysis of what's going on at the moment. If you have any uh, comments to make, as usual, just uh, send them to me directly or comment on the video as you watch it. I'll be back again tomorrow um, with some more thoughts, shall we say, on what's going on behind the scenes. But at the moment, uh, what's happening in Europe in secret with the, the UK secretly going behind the backs of the European Union is the usual devious divide and rule tactics of British diplomacy. Uh, Scotland, I think, is going to have to just wait a few more days to find out what the, the UK is going to do. I think Boris will prorogue Parliament again. I think we'll run out of time. I think we will be offered a, an extension, but we won't be able to take it. And we will crash out of the EU as planned on the 31st. And then the hedge fund man managers will make their money on their bet. Boris will get paid. And who knows, after that, there's going to be a general election. Boris might well actually decide just to retire at that point and sod off with his ill-gotten gains. And I wouldn't surprise him if he did that. He's done his job. He's brexited Britain. And he's done it in the most difficult, dirty, dangerous way. That's a lot of alliterations there, sorry. But it's the worst possible way of brexiting. But it might well be the best possible outcome for Scotland because it will focus minds on exactly how much the Scottish uh, industrialists are prepared to lose because of Brexit before they demand that we get a Section 30 order as well. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.